Good evening, everybody. And you're all very welcome to this, the third lecture in the Uniscape series um, of online talks where the disciplines meet. It was lovely to, to watch that video. It reminds me just of how similar the landscape uh, of the UK is to the landscape outside my window here in Ireland. Um, and to listen to the soundtrack of the video being punctuated by um, the doorbells being rung by people as they enter into the room and they're still arriving. Um, the, the theme of movement is so beautifully captured in your choice of video, Margarita. So it, it's my pleasure to welcome you all um, to this evening's meeting. We're delighted to have our speaker and I'm going to pass over to Tessa Matieni, who is the CEO of of the organization Uniscape, who's going to introduce you to both the speaker and this evening's respondent. So I hope that you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juano. Good afternoon to you all and welcome to this third uh, Uniscape World Discipline Meet seminar. Today we are particularly glad to have with us a young and brilliant researcher from the University of Padua, Margherita Cisani proposing a stimulating and innovative reflection on landscape and mobility, uh, starting from the topics of the so-called new mobility paradigm uh, defined by Scheller and Ari in 2006, the lecture will focus on two main research questions. How has this paradigm affected the landscape studies over the last 20 years? And how can landscape studies support the investigation in contemporary and historic mobility? And dealing this, with these issues, Margarita will explore the multiple and multifaceted relationship between uh, um, landscape and mobility, adopting uh, the landscape dimension as a research filter capable to face complexity and also to integrate different disciplinary fields. I suppose that uh, it's also important to announce that uh, Margarita's investigation on landscape and mobility can be framed in a broader field of studies carried on by the Department of Geographical Historical Science and the Ancient World at the University of Padua, where recently also a new master degree in landscape studies has been activated. Uh, just a few words in order to shortly in introduce Margarita Cisani's profile. Margarita is PhD in Historical Geographical Anthropological Studies with a thesis focusing on the interrelationship between everyday landscape and collective practices of mobility. She is currently a postdoc geographer, geographer in the Landscape of Human Mobilities Project at the Mobility and Humanities Center of the University of Padua. She also lecturer in tourism geography at the, the Cac Foscari University of Venice. Her research interest focus on landscape and mobility studies with particular attention in everyday landscape and non-motorized practices of mobility. Uh, we can add that in 2020, she published a book dedicated uh, to landscape and mobility. The title is Paesaggi e Mobilità, Strumenti per le Geografie del Quotidiano and is published by Franco Angel in Milan. Uh, so I suppose that's all, and I leave the floor to Margarita Cisani for her presentation. Thank you once again, Margarita, for your uh, participation. Thank you, Tessa, Connor, and uh, all of you uh, for um, allowing me uh, to to present this uh, uh, this paper today here and uh, thank you very much for your presentation and especially Tessa and I realized how um, ambitious I was in uh, proposing this topic and uh, so uh, I will try to sketch out some of the multiple connections between landscape and mobility so uh, for sure you there will be time to explore even more deeply this topic, for sure. And uh, um, so, uh, 
Yes, and another thing, another reason why I have to thank you is because, uh, as you said, yes, I published the book, but it is in Italian, and this um, moment today gave me uh, the stimulus to uh, maybe write down a proposal for a, a paper on a, on an international uh, journal uh, that I, is something that I'd like to for sure do uh, about these topics, but. Uh, let's uh, start. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to read because otherwise, um, speaking in English, uh, I, I risk to, to, to deviate from the, from the main topic. So I will read the, the, the paper I sketched out. Um, okay, so answering the UNESCAPE call for interdisciplinary gazes and encounters under our common interest towards landscape, the goal of this lecture is to sketch out some of uh, the multiple connections and reciprocal influences between landscape studies and the so-called new mobility paradigm. It is with this name, alongside the idea of a mobile turn in the social sciences and the humanities, that a mobility frenzy spread out in the last two decades, pushing scholars toward a more complex and nuanced exploration of mobilities and immobilities, as well as their impact on places and social life. The question from which today's reflections start are therefore the following. Did and how this new mobility paradigm affected landscape studies and how in turn landscape studies contribute to the analysis of contemporary and historical mobilities? A complete answer, of course, is hardly reachable, but I will try to propose some ways in which we could resolve these complex issues, drawing from the international debate, as well as from my personal research experiences. The term mobility, new mobility paradigm, originated by a paper from uh, two sociologists, John Ari and Mimi Scheller, in 2006, who argued that mobilities and immobilities were becoming pervasive in every aspect of our lives as individuals and as communities, from the micro scale to the global one, and that there were the need for new theoretical and methodological tools in order to go beyond sedentarist or nomadic conceptualization of place and movement in favor of more fluid and integrated visions of how mobilities affect societies and places. Although some scholars argued that this is not so new and not really a paradigm shift, especially from a geographical perspective, in a way it is true that a new approach to the study of mobilities and of society and spaces was necessary in particular because too often places and landscapes uh, are interpreted as fixed ent entities while they are dynamic and change in relation to the multiple mobilities they host, their definition being far from independent from the subjects and the practices performed within. Secondly, the study of mobility often focused on the infrastructure or flows, flow analysis, with attention on the points of departure and arrival, with poor consideration of what happens in between the two, even considering mobility time as dead time. Mobility then entails not only visible objects in, or people in motion, but also ideas, values, text, information, data, and so on. Mobility, and finally, is um, limited and a relational resource and it needs always its counterpart. For each thing or subject in motion, there is always something else fixed, stuck, or that is hindered to move. Moving forward, the insides of the mobility turn, Tim Cresswell stated that mobilities can be thought as a, of an entanglement of movement, representation, and practice. I would like to stress on this because it is one of the key points from which I started to structure my analysis on how landscape and mobilities interact. Another useful point made by Tim Cresswell is that we need to explore the politics of mobilities, breaking it down in uh, its con constituent parts, 
such as motive force, velocity, rhythm, root, experience, and friction. In order to understand the ways in which mobilities are both productive of social relations and produced by them. Of course, I'm not the first nor the last to point out the connections between these two apparently opposed domains. As for instance, already in 2006, a panel of distinguished scholars discussed some of the connections I will propose here today is the paper on the, on the left by Merriman, George Reville, Cresswell, Lorimer, Maitlis, Rose, and John Wiley. It is impossible then not, not to mention Tim Ingold and his renowned research on a phenomenological understanding of landscape, strictly related to the role of movement and precisely of walking. Or, for instance, it is worth mentioning Kenneth Olwig's contribution in defining the differences between performing and doing landscape, between the monocular view uh, and binocular ways of, of seeing. The first fixed and distant from the body, constructing a feeling of uh, possession and staged performance, whereas the second, the binocular view of the walker, engenders movement and uh, knowledge gained from a coordinated use of the senses, producing therefore a sense of belonging that generates landscape as the place of dwelling and doing. A quick search using mobility as a keyword in one of the most important journals on landscape studies, the Landscape Research Journal, shows in fact that there has been a growth in published paper related to mobility with occurrences raising from around 2006 onward. Landscape has been put therefore in dialogue with mobilities in a variety of ways, from the role of mobilities as a research method to mobility infrastructure as agents of landscape transformation, from narrative accounts of travels to the analysis of landscapes related to mobile practices, such as nomadic, nomadic pastoralism or bicycle tourism. The same exercise could be done on, in the opposite way, using, for example, the journal co-founded by John Ari, Mimi Scheller and Kevin Hannan in 2006, the Mobilities Journal, and searching for the word landscape. The result reflects, of course, the multiple uses of the word landscape itself. Nevertheless, it shows a growing presence of a cross-cutting discourse in which landscapes in motion come into being as encounters, narratives, emotions, everyday practices. Considering these contributions, it is possible to state that both mobility and landscapes can be seen as assemblages of materialities, representations, and practices, all affected by one another. Thinking about the video played at the beginning of the landscape scene from a train window, we can reflect on how landscapes are transformed by mobilities in their tangible and intangible aspects. Railways are one of the most visible signs of mobility on landscapes but were also one of the enabling factors of tourism and the, of the tourist gaze on landscapes. Mobility are conditioned by landscapes, by their natural and anthropological features. Think about the difficulties of passing mountains, chains via railways, as in the pictures, for example. Not only the infrastructures that sustain our movements need to cope with the different landscapes they traverse, but also the way we move and how we perceive this movement is affected by the landscape we cross. Think about the, the diverse feelings evoked by what we see beyond the window and what we saw in the video. And finally, the landscape itself varies according to the mode of transportation adopted, the speed, the driving forces of our movements, 
and many other variables, making it impossible to define landscape in a unique and static way, as the same area will be considered differently according whether explored by train or by car, for instance. In the attempt of making synthesis, connecting mobility with landscape studies under the impulse of the new mobility paradigm, I would propose to ideally walk along three different bridges, which symbolize three dimensions that unite landscapes and mobility. Along these bridges, we could trace the genealogy and maybe the future of research on landscape and mobility. The first bridge follows a point of view that could be defined mainly spatial or objective, and uh, in, it includes studies that dealing with the quantitative characteristics of and material effects of mobility on the landscape and vice versa, allow to deepen the material characteristics of this relationship. Example of these studies can be found in some landscape ecology approach, for example, especially those related to road ecology, for instance, or those related to the role of green and blue infrastructures for sustaining landscape quality and sustainable mobility. Or again, those studies in architecture focused on the health and place nexus that highlight the importance of some features on the, in the urban landscape such as broad furniture or the presence of vegetation as variables able to promote walking as a means of transportation, as a healthier means of transportation. The second bridge mainly concerns the individual dimension or more properly subjective and include both the reflection that focus on perceptual and psychological effects generated by the movement in the landscape as well as considerations on cultural representations and pra practices of mobilities, particularly associated with sp specific landscapes. Starting from Kevin Lynch's theory on legibility, developed and applied with the aim to understand the way in which people navigate the urban environment, this group of approaches also includes those studies that highlighted the presence of hiking, car, boat, or bicycle cultures that affect the way in which landscapes are represented and enacted. This wide bridge of connection includes also the more than representational stances, especially those that consider landscape as a verb, as something co-created through motion. The third and last bridge groups the approaches that mainly deepen the political or collective dimension, considering landscape mobility, or better, both, as social resources and commons, as always suggested. Considering the politics of mobility means, in fact, pointing out the role of movement as producer of identities and citizenships strongly related to the landscape. In the attempt of grounding these theoretical bridges, I will present here some insights derived from my PhD research related to everyday landscapes of walking groups, and then some brief notes on two other examples from my more recent research on bicycle tourism, as well as, of course, on the current uh, we cannot avoid to mention it, uh, a situation that is uh, showing new landscapes of forced mobilities and immobilities. In, the, in my PhD research, I um, tried to use uh, mobility as a lens to explore how people engage with places while moving and uh, namely walking to explore how people give value to, to these places, build memories, expectation towards landscapes, and develop a sense of identity and community. And I explored it through the case study of walking groups. 
uh, working groups are groups of people that gather once or twice a week to walk together within a neighborhood with um, the aim of increasing their well-being to fight loneliness, especially among, among elderly people and women. They are very commonly uh, common and diffused in the, in the Italian context, but I, I'm, I'm sure there are examples of um, these kind of working groups in other countries. Their aim is not um, particularly uh, focused on landscape appreciation, but the, our, my goal was to um, explore their relationship with their everyday landscape. Walking, in fact, is an extremely powerful and uh, heuristic practice. It has been celebrated and explored in the humanities and creative arts, in anthropology and ethnography, but it had, until recently, less consideration, we could say, in landscape planning and management, especially in, uh, in urban and suburban contexts, where it is considered as a marginal, even unsafe, means of transportation. I focused especially on these urban and everyday contexts to explore the landscape co-constructed by the walking groups. In my analysis, I compared landscape plans and official documents with an immersive exploration of the walking group practice, mainly based on uh, spatial transcripts and uh, questionnaires. These uh, spatial transcripts are I mean, a mixed and mobile technique developed by James Evans and Phil Jones that combines walking interviews with GPS tracks and recordings, enable, enabling a spatial, uh, spatial coding of the topics discussed. The maps shows the itineraries in the city of Bergamo in northern Italy, which, is the, which was the, the area of this uh, research. And all these itineraries are located in a peri-urban and very articulated landscape with patches of residential areas, some agriculture, historic neighborhood, urban parks, commercial and productive sites as well. Walking interviews disclosed the multidimensionality of the landscape experienced while walking, confirming the importance of doing it from below, starting from mundane practices. Moreover, the research revealed the multisensoriality of the mobile experience of landscape and the importance of what else is enacted during the walk all the informal chatting uh, used to reciprocally sharing knowledge and opinions on, on places and elements seen and encountered, as well as the relations between landscapes and other mobilities. For example, in these um, quotes, it is possible to note the disruptive effects that mobility infrastructures often have on those who walk, the weaker subjects of the mobile world, and on the small roads that tends to be forgotten or lived to other marginalities. On the right, during an evening walk, I recorded some considerations on the importance of street art in the aesthetic perception of the landscape or on the role of negative, it has to be <laughs> recognized, of smellscapes. And these two mm, pictures are two opposite but coexisting ways of entering in contact with landscape during a, a group walk. On the left, a sensory experience, we were stealing berries and tasting them. Um, and the second one is a panoramic experience of the upper town, which is not visible in the picture, but 
uh, it's a, um, a moment in which uh, the two person in the picture were sharing their um, helping each other to identify uh, elements in the landscape seen at a distance. Both of them, of these uh, moments, were enabled by the fact of being in a group. And this is uh, uh, particularly important for, this, uh, uh, for the ins insights that came out from this research. To analyze the data, I collect um, the, the interviews I recorded, and I adopted um, a quality quantitative approach representing on a map the data collected with the special spatial transcript and coding values and other elements in the interviews, matching them with the, their position in, in, in space. This and of course the analysis of the questionnaires and of the interview um, produced as a result, a list of, uh, of frictions in the landscape. And one of the main findings of this research is the acknowledgement that the group experience of the landscape is made up of frictions and discontinuities through which the landscape is encountered and co-created. These frictions can be material, uh, tangible or intangible, micro geographies or larger scale processes. And they all in an explicit or, or implicit way are implied in their landscape experience. The analysis of the working group's experience of the landscape revealed that landscape affect mobility, primarily because the choice of the itinerary is driven by the search for green and vegetated patches in the urban fabric of the city, considered as the greatest source of well-being. But then mobility affect, affects landscape because the majority of the participant uh, stated that uh, he or she knows the neighborhood better than thanks to the working groups. The working group's experience of landscape is made up of discontinuities, as I said before, frictions and barriers, encountered during the, the itineraries. And these frictions are, ha, have a key role because they force people to engage with landscape and with one another in relation to landscape. We will see in, uh, in the following slide uh, more properly how this mechanism work. And the group affect the landscape mobility experience because compared to the individual questioners, the working group interviews uh, were referred more to aesthetic, social, collective values compared to the individual questioners that I submitted. So I was saying about something about the role of um, of frictions. Walking together, in fact, can be considered uh, an enskillment process, a process in which through movement, the identification of the elements uh, and the perception of the elements of the, of the landscape and sharing together the reaction to these frictions perceived, it is possible to learn the landscape and how to, to move within the landscape and uh, ultimately to build a sense of belonging and citizenship. Of course, this is only part of the story. It's um, um, the positive, the virtuous circle um, and it has its own down as it is possible. However, this um, process that I tried to, to identify resonates with the words of Kenneth Olwigs as he explores the origin of the verb to have 
in the verb to heft, uh, referring to the ability of a flock of sheep to bond to particular pastures within a shared common. And um, especially in uh, all week's analogy with today's hefting walking groups, and in general, we could argue, argue other collective forms shared practice of mobility might be considered as another way to heft the land as landscape and to one another as a community or fellowship. Olwig said, uh, wrote that living in our city barricaded behind our computer screens as we are today, <laughs> unfortunately doing, we readily lose touch with the quadrupeds that once taught us to heft to the land as landscape and to one another as a community of fellowship. Another possible form of a shared mobility or anyway, a practice of mobility that highly requires enskillment and direct exposure to the landscape and uh, its frictions is cycling. Without deepening the analysis, I would like just to mention here the fact that exploring landscapes from the saddle of a bicycle helps in revealing some of the characteristics and counterintuitive paces of tourism, and especially slow tourism as um, as a, a mode of, of, of tourism that is gaining momentum in the, in the tourism industry. For example, by looking the, at the particular ways in which landscape is encountered, navigated and co-constructed in motion during a recreational practice such as bicycle tourism, it is possible to unpack the notion of slowness, slowness sorry, into a more complex set of acceleration and deceleration moments, which entails the relation with landscape in, in different ways. We speed up uh, during um, um, uh, a ride uh, downhill uh, and uh, we appreciate the, the, the landscape in a very fast uh, way. Um, or we, we stop and, uh, and have some difficulties while climbing, climbing uh, a peak. So uh, this is a very easy example, but uh, just to say that slow tourism is uh, more, uh, is made up of different kind of slowness and different speed itself that, uh, relates to landscape in different, uh, um, in different ways. Again, landscape perception is increasingly mediated by technological tools that are the more sophisticated, the wilder is the landscape of uh, our tourist adventure. And this is an uh, important um, filter or way in which we appreciate landscape or uh, the wild landscape while we um, we we travel by bicycle and finally bicycle tourism although considered as an experience um, in contact with the natural landscape with uh, fewer impacts a mild form of, uh, of tourism depends on a series of tangible and intangible resources that are produced and consumed by the cyclist, where nature can be uh, considered as a, as a social construct. So this slide is to say that uh, um, using the lenses of, of landscape uh, in, a, in, a, in an opposite way, um, in, in relation to, to what I did in, in the other, in my previous research, it is, uh, it helps in, in uh, unpacking the, the complexity of mobilities and especially the of tourist mobilities, such as bicycle tourism. 
And uh, lastly, another example of uh, landscape and mobility relation is, um, is the fact that I wanted to point out uh, the importance of considering landscape materialities, representation and practices in relation to two of the mobility crises that characterize this day and age. The first one is the striking effect that lockdowns had on tourism and on urban landscapes, which in their apparent emptiness and stillness revealed the need of rethinking the uneven and unsustainable ways in which we move as tourists or commuters. The picture is uh, Venice during the lockdown. The second one on the bottom is uh, simply a hint of what I believe that uh, Theano Terkenli will expand on uh, in her comments. That is the underexplored, I think, role of landscapes in the ways in which we frame the migrant discourse, especially in cases where different mobilities uh, overlay and interact, such as tourists and migrants' mobilities. So back to the opening questions, of course, uh, the, the one uh, between mobility and, and landscape is an unfinished symphony, but we can say that there are, we are witnessing a rise in uh, mobility and landscape related studies in which mobility challenges the apparent fixity of landscape. On the contrary, landscape continues to enrich the debate on mobilities, especially thanks to its wit, you can say, to the multiple dimensions and tensions that uh, its study entails, and in particular to the collective meaning that it uh, bears. Okay. Thank you. I hope I stayed in, in the times and I didn't went too fast in all of these topics, but I thank you very much for the opportunity. So thank you, uh, Margarita, very much for this inspiring, uh, rich and innovative lecture and also for your perfect timing. <laughs> you have explored various and different research issues, and I guess that uh, you also raised many questions. But first, I would leave the floor to our discussant, Tiano Terkelli from the University of Aegean, Greece. And uh, we are particularly honored to have with us this evening, Tiano. I suppose that many of you already know and appreciate uh, our groundbreaking and trans transdisciplinary work in landscape studies. Tiano is professor and founding member of the first department of geography in Greece, <laughs> University of the Aegean since 1994. She obtained her PhD in geography at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and her Master of Science in Landscape Architecture at the University of Wisconsin. Um, her research interests and publication are mainly focused on ge cultural geography, landscape geography and critical perspective to tourism. Among the other books, uh, we can recall uh, uh, Connection, Mobilities, Urban Prospect, and then Environmental Threats, the Mediterranean in Transition, uh, which Teano published in uh, 2015 with Annick Duviedroa and Louis Cassar. So uh, I leave the, the floor to Teano for her uh, remarks, suggestions, <coughs> and uh, notes. Thank you very much, Tessa. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. The honor is truly mine. It's a wonderful thing to be part of this, uh, this group and of these lectures. And uh, a very big uh, thank you and appreciation to Ms. Cizani, to Margarita, if you allow me, I will call her that because we have a long-standing relationship uh, for a very comprehensive and in-depth look at the relationship between landscape and mobility um, in a very well-rounded way, theor theoretically, methodologically, and empirically with many wonderful examples. 
Um, I would also like to commend um, uh, Margarita for this analysis of this relationship, which um, went back in time historically and um, honored, let's say, the foundations of uh, links of, of work done on the links between um, landscape and movement, generally speaking, uh, in the past. Um, not just the new mobilities paradigm, but uh, going back to um, um, work um, which links really to the humanist tradition in geography. Um, you mentioned Tim Cresswell, he comes from that tradition in, to a great extent. And also his more, the more recent work of um, uh, geographers on more than representational um, perspectives on, on landscape and, and place. One more comment, one or two comments, and then I, I would like to go more into a discussion, uh, uh, going a little further, um, building on Margarita's ideas and making some connections to the present. Um, uh, the third point is perhaps um, it would be a good idea, I don't know if you agree, um, when you talk about your spatial dimension, um, uh, the, the mechanisms, I think, I'm not remembering exactly how you mentioned it, um, I would fortify the, the spatial dimension even more um, and, and would um, talk about the spatial temporal dimension in order to incorporate time into space and place as in the form of landscape change, which is very important and always occurring, as you very well pointed out, landscape as you know becoming, um, not being. Um, and that of course me means um, adding the human and cultural effects of mobilities to the landscape, not just the ecological ones. Okay, uh, final point before I sort of uh, start more of a discussion is you 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 mentioned the situation in Lesbos, the the, the immigrant and refugee experiences of landscape through their own very tragic histories of uh, movement of mobility. We tried to do some some work on that a little bit of work on that, um, but it was really during the first years of their um, arrival in Lesbos with uh, colleagues from the University of Oulu in Finland, asking them about the landscape, their attachment, their understanding, their feelings about landscape. And specifically, of course, we wanted to know about the landscape of Lesbos. And this uh, um, uh, unfortunate uh, people, they, of course, um, became very nos nostalgic of their own landscapes at home. And most of them did not really had not really established relationships with um, their migrant um, camps and the island that uh, welcomed them or not welcomed them, I mean, uh, um, hosted them in any, in any case. Um, but perhaps this is, uh, this is a first um, stage and perhaps their prolonged uh, stay on the islands, depending on the experiences they have, and most of them are bad experiences, of course, um, will um, show us new perspectives, new sides to their connection to these new landscapes that they basically go through. Please keep in mind that most of them uh, want to go to Western Europe, Northern and Western Europe. So uh, Lesbos, Greece, and all the other countries in between are just a passage, a bridge to there. Okay, so um, I, I have to say again, thank you for the very interesting points you brought up. Uh, and um, I would just like to um, celebrate this idea of mobility in the landscape and uh, connect it to generally moving in the landscape, the idea of moving in the landscape, which um, links uh, with um, Kenneth Alwick's wonderful work on um, hefting and generally on the landscape. Uh, hefting, which leads us to uh, landscape's role in marches, demonstrations, public events that are linked, as you say, to frictions um, and connected to this notion of enskillment that you brought up. So we're talking about ways of claiming territory, of marking territory, of territoriality that are very significant, 
to public life and have a very strong political um, um, uh, dimension to them. But moving in the landscape is not only, of course, um, for purposes of uh, protest, for uh, demonstration and claiming space and claiming life, public life um, in, the, in the public domain, but also uh, with long-standing practices um, that are, again are linked to um, making landscape into home, if you like, uh, making it ours, claiming it, developing our identity in the landscape. Here, the examples could be feasts and festivals, parades of various sorts, dancing, especially folk dances in the landscape uh, in the spring or in other, at other times of the year. So many other things, educational walks in the landscape. I could bring up uh, Plato's peripatetic school, if you like, and of course, tourism. And I, um, I sort of uh, pause here with regard to tourism because you brought it up too and I'm very um, interesting, interested in what is happening um, to, tourism, to tourism these days. So let me just go um, back to your reference to the present age, the COVID-19 pandemic age, and talk about the, the great significance of walking of hiking, of claiming space and ourselves and our environments in our daily lives in, this, in, the, in, in the time of quarantine and, and lockdown. I'm not exactly sure how it happens in other countries, but um, I hear about it. And of course, in Greece, we've been under very, very strict quarantine for too many months already and continuing. Um, so walking has been our only form of relating with society, community, and space, our space, our, our neighborhoods. We're only allowed to go, you know, um, walking in our neighborhoods. Um, walking then as a counterpart to the quarantine, uh, which also uh, reflects um, new trends also in, in tourism. Um, of course, slow tourism is, is a wonderful example that you brought up. But I would also like to bring up another one. Revenge tourism is a new form of tourism that is growing in our days. Revenge tourism, quote unquote, um, uh, after such a, a long enforced enclosure, time of, of, of being enclosed. And um, uh, today, in fact, I was reading about uh, uh, new uh, surveys that have been done, especially among Europeans, about their plans for traveling in the future, for moving in the future, generally speaking. And um, most people, um, of course, it seems that um, tourism, um, domestic tourism, tourism in our own countries is here to stay. It has been fortified and will be uh, very significant in the next, um, I don't know, a few months, maybe longer, I don't know. This is one trend. And it's very important because uh, here again, we will have another opportunity, I think, of linkages between our spaces, our landscapes and ourselves, our communities, reclaiming our communities in the landscapes. And the second, the other trend is people want to visit, to, uh, visit beaches, more or less, beaches and outdoor locations like mountains, wilderness areas. So, um, you know, landscapes and outer spaces, generally speaking. That, that's, again, fortifying the relationship that you discuss between landscape and people and mobility, of course. And um, let me end with one final point. Uh, this all, um, this, this new trends of revenge tourism or going back to, uh, um, exploring again our um, familiar environments and or going to um, natural places, places, uh, outdoor places and all that, um, is certainly enriching and enhancing um, or hopefully will be enriching and enhancing the landscape itself. It is a reciprocal relationship. And let me give just an example of that. 
is the fact that there's another trend that has been noticed lately of people um, wanting to connect much more with their neighborhoods, their, the areas around their homes, um, their own spaces, um, their landscapes, of course, than in the past, tending to these um, places much more, both the built environment and the physical. So I see it as a very positive thing um, that, that we are um, now hopefully able to reconnect with our landscapes necessarily by moving through them. Thank you. Thank you, Teano, for your uh, inspiring and uh, stimulating comments. Uh, um, and now it's time to, to let uh, uh, people uh, interact with us. So uh, question time uh, will be chaired by Verle Van Velde. Verle, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I will turn the light a bit because it's, <laughs> it's getting too dark here. That might be better. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, well, maybe I just open the floor. Are there any questions um, from the audience for, um, yeah, for uh, uh, two speakers? I was not prepared yet for this. I was writing down some notes, so that's why I was uh, um, based on what uh, has been told. Maybe, Verle, hi, thank you yes. <laughs> for being here. Uh, maybe I can reply a little. Yes, that would be very good also. To Teano, yeah. In the meantime, because uh, yeah. maybe it will take a while to, to prepare some questions. Uh, and thank you, Teano, for, for your reactions. And uh, um, I, I, I wanted to, to, to reply because I, I, I realized that uh, uh, regarding your first two comments, there is one uh, one common uh, topic that is the the topic of time that probably needs to be more uh, uh, put into the the, <laughs> the discussion and all the elements that are that I proposed and of course past spatial temporal analysis it's uh, uh, something to to consider in the genealogy and uh, and all the human and cultural dimension besides the ecological one and time I think that is a word that needs to be considered more in this um, and also time in the uh, in the mechanism of attachment you said that the people in Lesbos are just passing and so how long uh, it needs how much time it need, is needed to uh, to have roots in a way to create some roots with the landscapes if it's needed um, or not. Uh, then um, you you mentioned the the, the political importance of uh, um, of walking and, and moving in general, uh, and I. I remember the, the the book by Rebecca Solnit, Wanderlust, that uh, uh, that deals a lot with the importance of of, of it, and uh, and the fact that uh, what I, I I I think that is very interesting is to uh, reveal the political dimension in in mundane practices, walking groups, for example, but also as you said uh, the feast festivals, educational walks, uh, or dancing, uh, and other ways to claim uh, the uh, relationship with landscape. And finally, I really thank you because you, you didn't know about it, but you, you uh, move uh, somehow towards what uh, I hope is going to be a project for the future that is related to this importance that is really uh, growing of uh, our uh, proximities as uh, destinations of uh, our tourist gaze and uh, yeah sort of um, I, I i like to 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 call it heritage you know, like using the the word here because it's something that very it's close to us but it's also something that we consider heritage in a way natural especially heritage but also cultural so this is a really interesting topic to develop more. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Margarita, for the uh, answer. Um, if you have any question, you can, uh, in Zoom, you have the option to raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. Uh, so then we can see who wants to get um, the, the digital or online floor. Um, I think one of the questions that we receive now is that you have any publications related or any research on um, the term of, what is it from tourism eyes? Maybe uh... Uh, maybe I can write some uh, comments on, yes. uh, on that. And maybe not uh, just one uh, paper that came into my mind speaking about uh, cycle mobility and uh, community is one recent paper by Anna Nikolaeva and uh, other, uh, among which there is also Tim Cresswell, on commoning mobilities. It's not properly about landscape, but it's more on the, uh, the, 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 the role of mobilities as, as commons. So it might, this might be, it might be interesting. And, and then maybe I'll, if you <coughs> leave the email browser vibes, I, I send you, or maybe we can exchange some, some literature references. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I, I will go or, or will try to explain what I was writing down <laughs> earlier on, because I think in, in the two, and so in Margarita, in your talk, and also in Tiano's um, um, reflection, I was wondering, um, well, you have those, uh, I think you call it visions or three, no, bridges, the spatial dimension. And I agree with Tiano that the, the time dimension is, is also important in, in that one. Then the, the individual and collective, but I was also wondering, I think there is probably a lot of how we uh, perceive and experience a place or a landscape while we are um, kind of mobile in that landscape. Isn't it also depending on the reasons why we are moving from one place to the other? Um, and I was kind of you know, writing down for myself, what are the reasons why people are moving from one place to another? Or eventually, uh, Tiano, when you were saying that uh, a lot of people are just walking outside now. Uh, I think it's probably not all, only in Greece, but everywhere. But that has another reason why I would move from or kind of uh, replace myself from A to B when I go to my daily job in the university, for example. Um, and I think that that is sometimes maybe, uh, or at least now I, I was kind of looking for, um, uh, do you have any explanations about the results, about the things you, you had done, or the reflections that are linked with why we are, I wrote down, why we are, or why, why we are, or why, why do we want to be mobile? Why do we want to uh, kind of move ourselves from one place to the other? Because the, 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 um, the refugees and the migration is something completely else, I think, than if you ask people to walk through a landscape and explain what they experience. Thank you. Should I go or yes. like yeah. Uh, yeah, you are. yeah. Should I answer or yes, you can, Margarita. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, of course, there are many, many different reasons why we we move in the landscapes and uh, they have uh, an impact on on uh, on how we pay attention to it and uh, how we build it and of course it, it's one of the um the question that tim cresswell poses to mobility and i would pose also of course to landscape when he uh, uh, proposed to uh, to unpack mobility in six different uh, um elements one of that is the driving forces so mm -hmm. why we we move and uh, of course it's something that we need to consider when we analyze our relation mobile relation with landscape in the um, experience that i had uh, and in uh, namely in the group or uh, in the working groups the reason is uh, to is because uh, um, they uh, use walking as a means for uh, um, enhancing their, their well-being. The mm -hmm. psychological 
not 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 just physical, not merely um, physical, but also psychological and social well-being. So staying together in outside in their neighborhood makes them feeling better. It's a it's a health. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a comprehensive health uh, reason. Let's say it's a, uh, so. This is the reason why they do that. Uh, they do not. Uh, pay attention to the landscape in a, in a let's say, in a uh, conscious way, because it, but sometimes they do, I, I identified three different uh, uh, modes of relations with the landscape for them. One is, of course, to um, explore the neighborhood, so uh, learning more about it, and this is, a, is the, the way that is more conscious. The other is more uh, immediate and um, bodily, is, is a contact that it's not, uh, uh, is, is not uh, uh, with the mind, but it is with the body. I don't know if I, if I made it clear. Uh, they are not aware of the landscape, of the importance of the landscape, but they are doing it. <laughs> so uh, this is a um, a difference. And, uh, and then, of course, in tourism, uh, landscape is one of the main uh, attraction. I, mm, I, I, in my personal not research experience as a bicycle tourist, uh, I went uh, along the um, wild Atlantic way that uh, Connor probably knows. Uh, it's, in, it's in Ireland. And that <laughs> the landscape of that, that coast is the reason why. I moved. So mm -hmm. the landscape itself can become the reason why we move. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. I just uh, picked uh, some. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if, if there was, a, I, I just wanted to raise this point because I think it's an important, uh, or at least I had a feeling that it was kind of missing. Mm -hmm. There is a question of, uh, yeah, Connor and also Margarita. Yeah. Could I come in there? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I don't know how to raise my hand at the bottom of the screen. I don't That's also that. okay if you do it like so this. <laughs> do it. In reality, um, to start by thanking Margarita for a very interesting and stimulating talk um, and to pick up on your observation or your question there, Virla, concerning um, the motivation for movement as having an impact. I'm kind of minded of the, of the phrase, sometimes it's the destination, sometimes it's the journey. Yeah. You know, but there's obviously exactly. lots of different motivations that will that will have an effect on your observation of what you're passing as you move from one place yeah. to the other. But I was kind of going on that. Um, a thought struck me when you introduced the notion of frictions when you're um, you're asking uh, the walkers in Bergamo of their experience of it and um, it struck me that that in a way the adversity of frictions creates a more politically neutral common experience so in other words everyone can agree that this part of the walk smells bad or that that step is or mm -hmm. there's a crack in the pavement that you have to be careful of um, and in a way, uh, it's interest. It, it strikes me as being interesting that that's the first reaction: is what it is that's adverse that the walkers have in common, and it, it, it tells me that they're not sharing um, the positive dimensions mm. in a you know in, in in a different way. They're keeping that kind of privately. And I immediately thought of the lyric in Leonard Cohen's song, there's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And it gets into the conversation, but also as researchers, sometimes the cracks are what we're looking for because that shines a light on what exactly is happening. So um, can you speak maybe a little bit more to why you think uh, the frictions were the first thing that came to mind? Um, in the people that you spoke to and whether frictions came to mind in the other groups in, in for example, in your slow tourism and 
I don't know whether you have direct experience, but perhaps Theano does, of uh, uh, the immigrant and the refugee experience. Thank you very much, Connor. And really, I didn't know I was uh, using Leonard Cohen. <laughs> and now I will, if you allow me, I will use this quote <laughs> again, <laughs> because it's really, uh, yeah, it, it, it speaks a lot uh, about this. And yeah, uh, first of all, frictions, um, are in a way, um, became neutral, neutralized in the, in, the, in the group. Some of them, some other uh, were uh, raised uh, some conflicts and different opinions. So not always that they agree on the, the smellscapes uh, that is negative. Some other times the, the, the friction triggered discussion and uh, different opinions. And this is also something that um, uh, I think is useful to understand the multiple uh, views on, on the landscape, on the fact that it's contested and it is home to different uh, uh, points of, of view on it. And uh, but looking at uh, the their experience and the different kinds of landscape they they traversed in their itineraries um, the the word frictions and uh, discontinuities as well uh, came out because uh, it is when there is a change of pace uh, uh, it is when there is something that uh, strikes out from the um, flat surface that you recognize the characteristics of the landscape. And uh, so it is a sort, it, it, of course, frictions are negative sometimes uh, because it's uh, the um, absence uh, of a, a pathway uh, and uh, the feeling of uh, unsafety. It uh, <coughs> can be a lot of things, but it can also be, uh, passing from a, a concrete surface uh, onto uh, a, a grass uh, surface. That, that also makes up, makes up a, a friction. And uh, so everything can be considered as a friction and it's where the, the, the colors and, uh, and the differences come out. Uh, uh, so I, I really think that they are important. I haven't yet applied this mode of uh, this lens to the bicycle tourism experience but I, I'm, I think it would might work and thank you for suggesting that. I may add something too yes. uh, to what uh, Margarita just said. Um, uh, as she said it is important to um, receive all this data and information from the from the, the people experiencing the landscape through mobility. And I would emphasize um, to take uh, in consideration all the stimuli. Um, and this may, may, may uh, require going in deeper into body language because these people seem to me from the photos that they're really enjoying their walks. I don't know if they're phrasing, you know, that they're actually expressing it or not, but there's so much that goes unsaid that goes on underneath you know, our, our surface reactions. And this is also the case in, uh, with tourism. And I just want to link with the previous question that there are various degrees to which tourists um, come, come, come in contact with the landscape or wish to come in contact with the landscape um, to experience it more fully, more deeply or more superficially, just go through uh, a, a, a destination, take some photos, you know, move to the next destination, been there, done that, this, this kind of thing. So it is really important, I think, uh, going back to this idea of moving in the landscape, to take in consideration um, all these different um, opportunities, stimuli, um, input data, that this um, this this uh, experience offers us in order to draw conclusions about how we um, what what we get out of that in the end what what the final 
outcome is. And for me, the final, final outcome is to a great extent um, reformulating ourselves, um, changing changes in ourselves. Uh, so the trip, the 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 journey, the, the whatever it is, the mobility pattern, no matter where it ends or where it is destined to end, um, creates us, creates who we are through this process, through this, through the, the mobility itself. As Constantine Kavafi said that, you know, Ithaca. Okay, thank you, Tiano. There was already a question from, I uh, have to, Margarida, not Margarita, but Margarida. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to link uh, mobility to the green infrastructures. Uh, I think it's important in urban areas um, to enjoy and for educational purposes to uh, to to walk a long stream or to walk to walk or to ride. Uh, along streams, uh, crossing woods or crossing uh, urban agriculture, uh, agricultural areas, observing nature, and then reach the open landscape if, if we can from the, the urban areas and to reach uh, the open landscape. I think it's a, a good experience. And I have another remark. Uh, the, uh, you are talking about, you are talking and I was thinking about uh, the present situation, no mobility. Uh, in Portugal, now we have no mobility at all. We had like the Greek with the severe <laughs> quarantine and the people now are aware of the need to have these walking infrastructures near home or uh, uh, starting near uh, their homes. Uh, and you mentioned, and I think it's very, very important, it's very, um, uh, very good to enjoy empty uh, squares that <laughs> used to be crowded. It's a very, very good experience. And uh, uh, it's the same in Portugal. We are trying to rethink uh, about tourism. Uh, so it's a, a good thing from this uh, coronavirus. It's uh, to rethink the, the, some um, ways of uh, living and social um, examples. Thank you, Margarita. From Margarita in Portuguese to Margarita. <laughs> Thank you. You want to uh, add something, Margarita? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, the importance of green infrastructure for, for, for sustainable mobility and for health as well. And I, I wanted to add only the, the fact that uh, Yes, I said empty, but I put quotes because uh, it, it is empty from, from a point of view, but there are still other mobilities in place. Uh, for example, all the, the uh, delivering, uh, all the people delivering foods and goods to the, our homes, they are still moving there uh, or in the, in the most difficult times of the quarantine and of the virus, we heard the, 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 the sound of the ambulances moving in this empty landscape. So there is always something moving and something uh, stuck. And uh, it's important to, to, to consider that as well. And uh, you said it's, uh, it's an opportunity to rethink uh, the, the the role of tourism in this uh, place, especially where tourism had a greater impact and places and landscape were, that were too much depending on, uh, on tourism. Can and, I, oh, sorry. No, no, go, go. I was maybe going to the question in the chat because uh, I saw that there's yes. something. I just wanted to say one more thing, not only green spaces, thank you for your point, but also blue spaces. Mm -hmm. and there is the exact same analog in tourism that tourists are saying, thank God for the empty beaches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose it will not stay empty uh, no. <laughs> in the long term. Uh, there is indeed a, a question from Timmy Tillman, if I read it well. Uh, maybe you can uh, yeah, switch on your microphone and explain it yourself. 
Yes. Uh, just a quick question because we walk a lot outside and we are confronted and have frictions with uh, mostly senior people running, rushing on e-bikes. <laughs> and uh, they don't realize where they are. They're just shh. And if you go to a popular place in the outside here in Germany, then you will be confronted with uh, them, uh, could be dozens or hundreds. Uh, so I, I don't understand the reason why they make this <laughs> excursion because it's it's so fast that uh, they, they cannot enjoy. I mean, we are walking, so uh, we, we, so we would like to know if this is part of the mobility. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I think so. It is part of the mobilities. And uh, yeah, it's, it's true that sometimes we use the means of transportation in a, not a very proper way <laughs> that enables the relation with landscape, but still it's not the means, it's the people that uh, decide how fast to, to go. So uh, it, I think it will, it depends. And uh, of course, e-bikes are um, a univer new universe to explore that uh, enables and uh, at the same time, um, uh, hinders uh, the, the, the relation with, with landscape. Many of these, uh, of, of these people, a lot of these people probably, they, without an e-bike, e they wouldn't go outside. So on one side is a positive thing. Uh, and of course, then it depends on how you use it, but uh, maybe it could be an opportunity if well used, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else who uh, has a question, so I might, uh, yes. I also think that uh, it might be the time to close this uh, session. And uh, now I'm looking to Tessa and Connor also, the partners in crime in a way, and Tomaso, who is uh, somewhere behind on the, in the technical part of this. Um, indeed, as Tomaso wrote in the chat, all the lectures, uh, of this lecture series are, series are recorded and they will be uh, published on the website um, later on. So you can see everything afterwards again. And to come back on the, the references uh, of someone or the question of someone to, to add some references. Um, I think also in the last talks, we said, well, we there, there are some references already in the abstracts that you normally have, but so maybe that is already a starting point. So I think, um, before we close, it might also be the uh, occasion to invite you for the next uh, session of the, uh, the webinar series, and that will be on the 30th of March, it's again a, a Tuesday, and then we uh, will have a talk from uh, Chiara Caravello, um, she's from Italy, but she's currently working in the University of Liège in Belgium, and she will talk about hidden landscapes as the uh, the underground heritage of a very specific landscape on the, uh, as she said, the three countries park. So it's an area covering the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. And it's about uh, um, yeah, the landscape that we have below the surface. So it will be a very uh, uh, different topic than today, but also hopefully very interesting and inspiring. So we hope to uh, welcome you all again um, at the end of this month. And uh, yeah. Looking forward to see you again and have a, a similar interesting discussion. I don't know if someone else wants to add something on it to Sarah Connor. No, otherwise we uh, close the session and we look forward to see you next time. And just spread the news about it. 